Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Danny Fleischman with Leading Edge Oral Surgery. I work out of our Woodbury and Plainview offices. And tonight I'm going to talk about not the most exciting topic, but um, a relevant topic, medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw. So every few years, uh, the American Association of Oral Maxillofacial Surgeons comes out with position papers about different topics. And every few years, they come out with a position paper on osteonecrosis of the jaw. They came out with one in 2007, then again in 2009, 2014, and this is the most recent one from 2020. And the purpose of these papers are to update risk assessments of developing MRONJ, a comparison of the risk and benefits of medications related to osteonecrosis of the jaw, in order to facilitate medical decision-making for the treating physician, dentist, dental specialist, and patient with established algorithms, and guidance to clinicians regarding differential diagnosis of MRONJ in patients with a history of exposure to anti-resorptive medications, and also for um, MRONJ prevention measures and management strategies for patients based on disease stages. Now, the first thing you need to be aware of is which medications are considered anti-resorptive medications and the different classes of these medications. There are a lot of them. And if you see a patient, you're unsure of any medication they're on, excuse yourself, look it up, figure out what type of medication it's on. But the main anti-resorptive medications are bisphosphonates, which are anti-resorptive medications that are effective in managing cancer-related conditions, including hypercalcemia malignancy, spinal cord compression, and pathology associated with bone metastasis in the context of solid tumors, which are uh, breast, prostate, and lung cancer, and as well as multiple myeloma. They're also given as anti-resorptive medication in the prevention of osteoporosis, related fractures in patients with osteoporosis and osteopenia. Another class of medications that is an anti-resorptive medication are denosumab, which are, which are agents that exist as fully humanized antibodies against rank ligand, and they inhibit osteoclast function and associated bone resorption. Rank ligand inhibitors, unlike bisphosphonates, do not bind to the bone, and their effects on bone remodeling are mostly diminished within six months of cessation of treatment. And that's why medications like Prolia, which is a denosumab, is given every six months. Um, there are other medications that are not as common, but newer ones like Remosumab, which is a monoclonal antibody used for fracture prevention in osteoporotic women. Um, it's administered subcutaneously, and it works via a different pathway, the Wnt pathway by binding to and inhibiting sclerostin, um, resulting in increased bone formation and decreased bone resorption. Now, here's a summary of some of the most common medications that are both bis bisphosphonates and denosumab. And the important thing to know that if someone says they're on denosumab or they're on zoldronic acid, that doesn't really tell you too much information. For instance, with zoldronic acid, both reclass and zobeta are the same exact medication. They're just given for different reasons. A patient is given reclass for osteoporosis, and it's given yearly. A patient's on Zometa for metastatic disease, and it's given monthly. And you can see how the amount of medication a patient's receiving is very different, even though it's the same medication. This is also true for denosumab. Prolia and Exgeva are the exact same medication. Prolia is given every six months, while Exgeva is given monthly for metastatic disease. And you can see how just because a patient's on denosumab doesn't really tell you much information about why they're on it or how often they're getting it. Now, the first thing we need to know, what defines medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw? So all three of these must be true for a patient to be diagnosed with medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw. They have to have current or previous treatment with an anti-resorptive therapy alone or in combination with immune modulators or anti-angiogenic medications. There must be exposed bone or bo bone that can be probed through an intraoral or extraoral fistula in the maxillofacial region that has persisted for more than eight weeks. And this last part is very important. They can't have any history of radiation to their jaw or metastatic disease to their jaw. Once they have any, any history of radiation to the jaw, it's just osteonecrosis of the jaw from the radiation, not medication related. The first thing we, see, we do with any patient who has exposed bones you try to, or any symptoms of medication related osteonecrosis of the jaw is you have to stage it. There are four different stages of osteonecrosis of the jaw. The first is stage zero, which is there's no exposed bone, there's no fistula to the bone. However, the patient has vague symptoms that cannot be attributed to anything else except the possibility of early hemorrhage. They could have pain, numbness, but again, there's no exposed bone, no sign of infection, just these vague symptoms. Stage one is exposed and necrotic bone or a fistula in an asymptomatic patient. 
Stage two, they have exposed necrotic bone or fistula, but now there's a sign of infection. And stage three is exposed and necrotic bone or fistula with sign of infection and pus. Plus, they could have exposed necrotic bone extending beyond the, the uh, region of the alveolar bone up to the sinus. They can have pathologic fractures. They can have extra oral fistulas. They can have oral antral, oral nasal communications, and they can have oste osteolysis extending to the inferior border of the mandible or the sinus floor. Now, the article does give a lot of studies about different risks for patients of developing MRONs with IV medications, oral bisphosphonates with um, the nosumab. And the key is not to memorize each number or know each number. You can see a common trend. Patients who are receiving a bisphosphonate or nosumab for metastatic disease have a much higher incidence of medication-related osteonecrosis than the patient receiving for osteoporosis. You can see patients receiving Zometa or Exgeva have about a 5% risk of developing MRONG, and patients receiving osteoporosis medication, medications for osteoporosis, whether oral or IV, have anywhere from a 0.02% to a 0.3%. So you can see that's a pretty large difference in patients with osteoporosis versus patients with metastatic disease. What's also important in evaluating patients is how long they've been on the medication. And you can see with Zometa and Exgeva, both which are given for um, metastatic disease, that two-year mark is very critical. A patient who's been on it for less than two years has about a 2% chance of developing um, osteonecrosis. While once they've passed that two-year mark, they have anywhere from a 4 to 18% risk of developing it. And you can see in patients on bisphosphonates or osteoporosis, at baseline, or even less than four years, they have a very, very low risk, close to zero. And even greater than four years, the risk only jumps up to about 0.21%, which is relatively low compared to the 5 6% you see with Zometa and Exgeva. Now, there are a lot of local factors that can contribute to the development of medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw. Uh, the first and most common is dentoalveolar surgery. That's probably the biggest reason for patients developing osteonecrosis of the jaw. And it's seen much more common in the mandible, almost two to three-fold than in the maxilla. You also see a large increase in medication-related osteoporosis of the jaw in patients wearing dentures. This is likely due to poor-fitting dentures causing occlusal trauma, which can trigger um, osteoporosis of the jaw. It can also be osteoporosis of the jaw can also be triggered from eating something sharp that digs in. I saw a patient a couple of years ago who developed osteoporosis of the jaw on a lingual tori, just from trauma to the tori. So you can see this, any trauma to the mouth can cause osteoporosis of the jaw. It's also more common in patients with periodontal disease and periapical pathology when taking out a tooth. There's a higher prevalence in females. Now, this is not totally relevant because you do see more females on bisphosphonates for osteoporosis and breast cancer, while males, you would see it more likely on for metastatic prostate disease. What's interesting is in young patients who've been on bisphosphonates for a long period of time, they really see no evidence of osteoporosis in patients less than 24 years old. Patients receiving corticosteroids in addition to bisphosphonates or denosumab are at a much higher risk of development of osteonecrosis, and they're unsure about tobacco use if it really is a risk factor in development of MROG. Obviously, it would delay healing, but they really don't see much of correlation between tobacco use and development of medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw. One thing a lot of people talk about with um, anti-absorptive medications is some sort of drug holiday before and after treating. And the historical use of a drug holiday was intended to decrease the prevalence of osteonecrosis of the jaw due to high-risk surgical procedures. And the group that put together the most recent um, position paper by Amos um, was unable to reach a consensus regarding recommendations on drug holidays and was evenly split between offering drug holidays and not offering drug holidays to patients and they believe that the risk of potential negative effects of suspending anti-resorptive medications may outweigh any benefits. One thing they did mention to be cautious of is patients on denosumab, where if there's an extended period of time of being off the medication, you actually see a, a multi-fold increase in resorption. So they recommend if you are going to do a drug holiday with denosumab, not to go any longer than three to four months before surgery and six to eight weeks following surgery, which falls into that si every six month window of receiving the medication. So what they say is you should take out tooth about three, four months after the patient receives their infusion, and then they can get their normal infusion six months after their previous infusion. 
There's also talk about different biomarkers to look at osteoplast and osteoblast activity. There's CTX, um, VEGF factor activity, um, endocrine function, and parathyroid function. They found that none of these are useful markers and should not be used in determining any risk involved in an extraction on a patient who is on any anti-resorptive medication. So they totally want these to be avoided at all costs. One thing they talk about is implants in patients receiving um, anti-resorptive medications. And what they feel is that caution should be used, especially in patients who are on longer duration of therapy and with steroid use. And when they looked at studies, they found actually a lot of conflicting studies. One study they looked at, there was increased risk of osteonecrosis with implants in the posterior jaw and with those patients who had greater than three years of bisphosphonate use. Another study they looked at had no increased risk. And a third study actually showed a decreased risk in osteoporosis patients matched with controls who did not get dental implants. Um, they don't mention this, but one possible reason for this is if a patient's not getting implants, they may have a poor fitting denture, a poor fitting partial, or a poor fitting flipper that could cause occlusal trauma as well. While if the implant does integrate and does well, they're less likely to have trauma after that initial integration. Now they do talk about implants. They see two types of failures in implant patients receiving anti-resorptive medications. They see early and late failures. Early failures are implant surgery triggered, which are in those first four to six months of healing. And then implants presence triggered, which usually are greater than one year after surgery. And what they found interesting is the late failures were very different than the late failures you typically see in a patient not on anti-resorptive medications. These failures was not a failure of integration of the implant. <clears throat> was not a failure of integration of the implant. It was actually necrotic bone sequestered off and the implant was still integrated within that sequestered bone, which they found very interesting and didn't know what to make of it at this point. What their conclusion with implants was that robust data does not exist and available data is conflicting. Therefore, Amos suggests that if dental implants are placed, informed consent should be provided to include the low risk of osteonecrosis as well as early and late implant failures. And these patients should be on regular long-term recall schedules. Now, we recently implemented in our practice um, Surgical consent, in addition to the surgical consent for the extraction of the implant, consent for a patient who's previously received anti-resorptive medications. This was at, um, there was a recent, our malpractice insurance actually talked about a case where a surgeon was sued, even though he'd informed consent for the patient because he didn't have specific consent related to osteonecrosis from anti-resorptive medications. So we felt this was a good thing. And this consent was actually provided by our malpractice insurance. The article also talks about prevention strategies for the patient. And as you can see in both the non-malignant disease as well as malignant disease, the most important thing is education of patients about the high risk of osteonecrosis, as well as optimizing their dental health prior to initiation of any therapy. With non-malignant disease patients, which are those for osteoporosis, they feel there should be no alteration in operative care for most patients. However, you may want to consider drug holidays as needed, how long patients... <clears throat> how long patients have been on the medications, if there aren't any steroids, um, any sign of infection, inflammation at time of extraction. Because again, if you have periodontal disease or periodontopathology, you're at a higher risk of development of emrange. With patients with malignant disease, you really want to avoid surgery if possible. You want to try to maybe do root canals on non-restorable teeth and bury the roots in place. And in these patients, dental implants are absolutely contraindicated while they can be placed in patients on anti-resorptive medications for osteoporosis. They also go over what you should do for a patient at the initial evaluation. Obviously, you want to get a history and physical. You want a radiographic exam of the patient, whether it's a panoramic, a CT, MRI, a PET scan, whatever is indicated. And you want to get a preliminary stage of the osteonecrosis. At this point, you initiate non-operative measures, which is chlorhexidine rinses, antibiotics as needed, or sequestrectomy if needed. You want to keep seeing these patients, you have to repeat staging, see if there's stability of disease, progression of the disease, and you have to keep evaluating if they should go down a path of surgery or non-operative techniques. So with non-operative techniques, you usually typically do local wound care, you do antibiotic rin antimic antimicrobial rinses like Paradex, and you give antibiotics as needed when there's signs of infection. And this can go on for a long period of time till ideally you get a sequestrum that can be removed and the patient goes on to a 
to heal. With operative therapies, they're different for both the maxilla and mandible. And when you talk about mandibular disease, operative therapy could be a marginal resection or a segmental resection or actually a flap to reconstruct the area. These are obviously pretty major surgeries, but sometimes they're needed if patients has pathologic fractures, extra oral draining fistulas, and really no regression of the disease. For maxillary disease, you may see alveolectomies um, and partial maxillectomies up to the sinus floor if disease is, keeps progressing and does not resolve. So the conclusion of Amos was that it's clear that the benefit of fracture prevention outweighs the risk of EMROG development in osteoporotic patients. This benefit is even more favorable in cancer patient population where bone stabilizing medications significantly improve quality of life. And it is detrimental when anti-resorptive medications are withheld due to EMROG safety concerns. So their feeling is you need to treat these patients whether it's surgically or not and stopping the medications can be worse than the EMROG itself. I'm just gonna go over one case quickly um, to illustrate how these cases can happen to any one of us. Uh, this is a patient I saw about a year ago. He presented with these dental implants were replaced a long time ago. He was a poor historian, but I was able to get out of him that he does have metastatic prostate cancer and has been on Exgeva for a long time. His prostate cancer is pretty stable, but he kept having pain and swelling around these implants. And as you can see, they have almost 60% bone loss and they were probing around them with purulence. Um, we tried a course of antibiotics, Paradex, but nothing could get the patient to feel better. And after just talking to the patient, we decided on removing these implants. He was well aware of the risk of developing EMRONG, and we would try to do it as atraumatically as possible, but even with that pretty high risk on a patient with long-term anti-resorptive medications for metastatic disease. So after the removal of the implants, the patient had fistulas in the area, but we took multiple scans and we never saw any sequestrums or anything that we felt would warrant operative therapy. So he was in a non-operative therapy for about four months. And then he came in um, for his follow-up and it looked very different. We took a CT scan and you can see that he has a pretty large sequestrum in his right mandible, just above the uh, inferior alveolar nerve and right by the mental foramen. At this point, we decided it would make sense to go and remove the sequestrum and see what it looked like. And in my experience, when you see patients with these sequestrums, they're completely loose in soft tissue. You actually have a, usually a very healthy bed of granulation tissue below the bone. So this is what he looked like at that appointment. And you can see the necrotic bone in the center. Um, and you can see the tissue around it was very inflamed, uh, bled very easily. So the right side is that piece of necrotic bone that was removed. It's removed with forceps relatively easy. It's completely loose. You don't have to use any force to separate from any underlying bone. And as you can see in the picture on the left, you have a really nice, healthy granulation tissue underneath this flap, underneath this where the bone was removed. In this case, I don't try to close this site. I leave it open. I give the patient a monojet syringe and have them irrigate the site. And you typically get pretty good healing in this stage once you get the sequestrum removed. Obviously, he's at risk for other sequestrums. He could lose other teeth from this. But this was a couple months ago, and since then, he's had no complaints, no pain, no signs of exposed bone or any infection at this point. So these cases do resolve. And again, you have to treat the patient. You can't just say, I can't touch you. I have to leave these failing implants in there because I'm concerned of developing MRI. It's all about patient education, the patient understanding, you understanding the risk, and just taking care of the patient. Dr. Fleischman, what medical precautions do you take? Do you pre-medicate? And what antibiotics do you put patients on after surgery if needed? So I don't pre-medicate. Precaution-wise, I try to get a history of when they're less. Even though they're unsure about drug holidays, I do like somewhat of a drug holiday for patients not in pain, no signs of infection, just to try to delay it a little bit. Um, Post-operatively, I would give either amoxicillin if they're not penallergic. If they were penallergic, I would give a ZPAC. Z-Pak. 